SpaceX is just days from Starship's 11th integrated flight test, the final launch of the Block 2 generation of ships and boosters. The newly released flight plan is packed with bold experiments and high-stakes objectives pushing far beyond what we've seen before. Meanwhile, work on the second launch pad at Starbase and preparations at the Kennedy Space Center are hitting major milestones, showing that Starship is on the verge of entering a new era. Let's break it all down. After wrapping up the final pre-launch static fire tests, Ship 38 and Booster 15, the hardware for Starship Flight 11, are now undergoing pre-launch preparations. Engineers are carrying out last-minute verifications on engines, avionics, hydraulics, cryogenic plumbing seals, and structural welds to ensure both vehicles are truly flight-ready. SpaceX has officially set October 13th as the target launch date, releasing a detailed mission profile that layers new challenges on top of Flight 10's successes. For Booster 15, the main focus is testing a new landing burn sequence that will eventually become standard for next-generation Block 3 Super Heavies. The booster, which previously flew on Flight 8, will launch with 24 reused Raptor engines. This will mark the second time SpaceX refly a super heavy booster, a milestone that would demonstrate progress toward making the world's largest rocket truly reusable. Engine and booster reuse lowers cost while exposing hardware to repeated thermal cycles and stresses, giving SpaceX vital data on durability and performance reliability under real-world conditions. After stage separation, Booster 15 will attempt a controlled splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. Its landing sequence will begin its landing burn with 13 Raptors, then transition into a five-engine divert phase to fine-tune its trajectory. Earlier flights used only three engines here, but the new baseline for V3 Super Heavies will employ five, adding redundancy in case of spontaneous engine shutdowns. Finally, the booster will shift to its three center engines, enter a brief hover above the gulf, and then shut down before splashing down. The goal is to measure how the vehicle behaves as engines sequentially shut down and hand off control between phases, data essential for future tower catches. Ship 38 carries equally ambitious flight goals. It will attempt the deployment of eight Starlink simulators, mass dummies approximating the dimensions and weight of next-generation Starlink V3 satellites. Flight 10 achieved the first payload release, but two units struck the doorframe, exposing clearance issues. Flight 11 will validate refinements to the deployment mechanism, paving the way for operational Starlink launches as early as Flight 13. The ship will also attempt an in-space Raptor relight using propellant from its header tanks. This test is critical for future missions, demonstrating that Starship can restart its engines in orbit to perform controlled re-entries from low Earth orbit or deep space, ensuring a safe return to Earth. The flight also serves as a heat shield stress test. Engineers have removed tiles in select areas, as was done in previous missions, and for the first time also from sections where tiles bond directly to the stainless steel hull with no protective layer underneath. This deliberately creates a worst-case re-entry scenario by exposing the ship's unprotected stainless steel structure to intense heating. To minimize risk, these tests are likely confined to non-critical sections, such as the aft skirt, rather than above the main propellant tanks. By subjecting bare steel to extreme re-entry conditions, SpaceX can evaluate structural tolerance and gather critical data on tile durability and design margins. Finally, Ship 38's descent includes a banking maneuver, simulating return-to-launch site profiles. This aggressive aerodynamic sequence bleeds velocity while testing subsonic guidance algorithms before transitioning into a landing burn and splashdown in the Indian Ocean. This banking maneuver prepares for precision tower catches, which could debut on Flight 13. In short, Flight 11 is far more than a repeat. It's a rehearsal of the techniques and technologies SpaceX plans to standardize on the road to fully reusable orbital rockets. The launch pad itself is also being readied for Flight 11, which will mark the final liftoff from Pad 1's orbital launch mount before SpaceX rebuilds it to match the upgraded design now under construction at Pad 2. In preparation, teams have removed the ship's static fire test stand from the OLM and transported it back to the production site, clearing the deck for launch operations. Following that, Technicians reinstalled the 20 booster hold-down clamps one by one, ensuring each mechanism was fully serviced and ready. The propellant delivery hardware temporarily installed atop the booster quick disconnect hood for static fire testing has also been removed, with crews now restoring the BQD system to full operational status. At the same time, 
Maintenance and repair work is underway across the entire launch mount to restore systems and fix wear points ahead of Flight 11. Meanwhile, Pad 2, after over a year of construction, is approaching readiness to host Starship launches. Nearly all scaffolding has been removed from the orbital launch mount, revealing a largely complete structure. Teams are now focused on commissioning critical systems. The booster oxygen quick disconnect has undergone repeated extension and retraction tests, with methane BQD testing planned next. Once electrical and plumbing connections are finalized, the remaining portions of the protective hoods will be installed on both quick disconnects to shield them from Raptor exhaust and weather. The flame trench deluge system has already undergone multiple tests, gradually increasing water volume, pressure, and duration, some for nearly a full minute to verify all components operate correctly, from storage tanks and pressurization units to plumbing, drains, and distribution outlets. Future tests will continue ramping flow and pressure until full capacity operation is reached. The top deck of the launch mount remains disconnected from all pressurization systems, which will be reconnected once ongoing work is complete. Following this, a full pad flooding test will activate both the flame diverter and launch mount water systems, providing critical protection against the intense thermal and acoustic loads generated during Starship liftoff. Shielding now covers more than half the gantry as installation of high-pressure, cryogenic, hydraulic, and electrical components nears completion. Scaffolding around the tower's chopstick arms has been removed, signaling the end of major upgrades. The arms have already undergone extensive motion and load testing, with adjustments made as needed. Cladding installation on the lower tower sections is progressing, protecting internal components from super-heavy exhaust and debris. The tank farm is being tested with liquid nitrogen to validate pumps, heat exchangers, valves, piping, and manifolds, ensuring reliable propellant delivery to Pad 2. The final major component awaiting installation is the ship quick disconnect arm, which is expected to be installed soon. If progress continues at the current pace, Pad 2 should be fully operational by year's end, ready to support the first Block 3 Starship launches, beginning with Flight 12 early next year. At Kennedy Space Center, work on the Starship launch pad at LC-39A is progressing rapidly. A major milestone was reached with the installation of the flame diverter buckets into the trench. With the buckets in place, engineers are now integrating the trench plumbing and water spray systems to safely channel booster exhaust and dissipate the intense thermal and acoustic energy during launches. Next up is the orbital launch mount, currently under construction at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility within Kennedy. Nearby, the ship quick disconnect arm for the launch tower is also in fabrication. Launch tower sections for SLC-37 are being pre-assembled at the same site. Plans call for at least two pads at SLC-37 to support a potential flight cadence of up to 76 launches per year. The gigabay is also taking shape, with steel columns now being installed after most of the floor concrete work is complete, marking the start of vertical construction. Starbase's Gigabay is close behind, with floor concrete finishing and vertical steelwork expected to start soon. For a full breakdown of the Gigabay rocket integration facility and its capabilities, check out my previous video linked in the description. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. Italian aerospace company Avio, a publicly traded firm and the prime contractor for Europe's Vega launcher family, as well as a key supplier of solid and liquid propulsion systems for Ariane rockets, signed a 40 million euro contract with the European Space Agency on September 29th to develop a reusable rocket upper stage. Formally called the Reusable Upper Stage Demonstrator, this project aims to build and test a fully reusable orbital stage, showing clear conceptual parallels to SpaceX's Starship in the renderings released alongside the announcement. Similar to Starship, it features forward and aft aerodynamic flaps for precise flight control and a thermal protection system of heat shield tiles to survive atmospheric reentry. While Starship's upper stage is about 50 meters tall with a 9 meter diameter, Avio's stage will be smaller, 23 meters high and 3.4 meters in diameter, consistent with its Vega-derived design. It could pair with a solid-fueled P-120C booster, similar to Vega C's first stage, yielding a full-stack height of 36.5 meters. By comparison, Starship's full stack currently reaches 123 meters, with plans to extend to 150 meters. 
AVO emphasized that the project will leverage its experience with Methalox propulsion systems, likely using a cluster of MR-10 engines, which are under development for the upper stage of its upcoming Vega E rocket. Each MR-10 engine is capable of producing 98 kilonewtons of thrust with a specific impulse of 362 seconds. Unlike Starship, which targets 150 tons to low Earth orbit for mega constellation launches, Artemis lunar missions, and eventual Mars fleets, Avio's demonstrator focuses on cost-effective reusability for commercial and institutional missions. The stage is designed to operate expendably or reusably, supporting missions such as cargo delivery to low Earth orbit, in-space servicing, and potentially crewed operations in the long term. If AVO meets its schedule, a first orbital demonstrator flight could occur by decade's end, validating technologies like thermal protection, flap-based aerodynamic control, and propulsion systems essential for safe, repeatable reusability. On September 29th, a powerful explosion ripped through Firefly Aerospace's Briggs, Texas test facility during a routine hot fire of the Alpha rocket's first stage, destroying the booster and sending thick black smoke high into the sky. Firefly founded in 2017 by former SpaceX engineer Tom Markusik, developed Alpha as a two-stage small-lift launch vehicle designed to carry payloads of up to 1,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit. The 29-meter-tall rocket is powered by four kerosene-fueled Reaver engines on its first stage and a single Lightning engine on the second. Targeting both commercial and government markets, Alpha has already secured contracts with NASA, the U.S. Space Force, and Lockheed Martin. Since its debut in September 2021, Alpha has flown six missions, with only two achieving full success. The destroyed booster had been slated for Alpha's seventh mission, a Lockheed Martin contract to launch TACSAT, an experimental technology and communication satellite developed under the U.S. military's tactical satellite program. Before shipment to the launch site at Vandenberg Space Force Base, Firefly runs new boosters through acceptance testing at Briggs. These tests involve full fueling and hot fire operations to simulate flight conditions and expose any design or manufacturing issues before the rocket reaches the pad, an industry standard practice. During the September 29th test, a sudden failure, believed to have originated in the engine bay, triggered a fireball and violent explosion. Witnesses described a massive plume of black smoke, and early speculation pointed to catastrophic failure in the propulsion system or associated plumbing. Firefly has not yet released a detailed technical assessment, but confirmed the event occurred during routine acceptance checks. The company emphasized that strict safety protocols were in place and that all personnel remained safe. With the Flight 7 first stage destroyed, Firefly now faces a significant setback. The mission, originally scheduled for late 2025, will require construction and qualification of a new booster, a process that could push the launch into early 2026. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.